The following was originally published in 2018, and while I stand by the critiques of The Last Jedi I make, I deeply regret any direct personal attacks I make against Ryan Johnson, Kathleen Kennedy, or any other employee of Lucasfilm. Those comments were made in anger and frustration, and I will do a separate video about that after this series. Previously on the Anti-Trekker, the Walt Disney Corporation decided to attempt to silence me. But I will not go quietly into the night. I will not give up without a fight. Today is my independent. Actually, in truth, I needed to rewrite this whole section of today's video. I wrote, recorded, and partially edited a 10-minute foaming-at-the-mouth rant about the evils of Disney for them falsely DMCAing two of my videos in this series. I even went so far as to suggest there may actually be a political bias in in their DMCA practices despite the fact that my reviews are going out of their way to not be politically biased. I have to say, it was quite the rant. But then, something happened. Something I did not expect, but I suppose based on my prior videos, I really should have. You see, one thing that I've said before is that people need to stop blaming Disney for the horrible content of The Last Jedi. I've seen video after video on YouTube talking about how Disney ruined Star Wars. The truth is that Disney did not ruin Star Wars. Lucasfilm did that all on their own. Kathleen Kennedy was already working on story treatments for episodes 7, 8, and 9 when Disney bought Lucasfilm. And it's very likely that while we may not have gotten the exact same films that we did get had George Lucas stayed at the helm. All of you out there that are screaming right now that George Lucas should be in charge are the same people that were ready to crucify old George for the prequels. So yeah, I don't understand why you're so sure that Star Wars be any better with George Lucas considering that Kathleen Kennedy was already there anyway. Anyway, Disney is not so much a production company like they used to be as they are now more of an IP collection and distribution company. Contrary to popular belief, Walt Disney Pictures doesn't actually produce any films. They just distribute them, and the production of the film is done through other companies. So, for example, Jerry Bruckheimer Films created Pirates of the Caribbean. You remember that classic Disney film, Beauty and the Beast, that was live action last year that everybody says was so awesome? Yeah, that was made by Mandelville Films. How about the craptastic A Wrinkle in Time that recently came out? Oh, that was Whitaker Entertainment. But of course, there's the big three that produce Disney films, Marvel Studios, Pixar, and of course, Lucasfilm. Disney is not interested in micromanagement of all these studios. They are more interested in whether or not what their investment in those studios is if it turns a profit. That's really about it. If you look at the Marvel Universe. People keep talking about how Marvel is controlled by Disney and all this stuff. You know what? Look at the tone of the first couple of Marvel movies and yeah, The Incredible Hulk was a little bit of an outlier, but I think that was Marvel Studios getting their feet on the ground more than Disney came in and changed everything. The Really, the tone of the entire MCU was set by the first Iron Man film, which was not a Disney film. Anyway, Disney, of course, only care about protecting their intellectual property or IP rights to those films. So it does this through the use of bots. And I have said before, I'm not a fan of this system. I genuinely believe that it should not be legal for bots to accuse you of anything. I think only a human being should be able to accuse another human being of a crime. But whatever. The Matrix. Or Skynet. Anyway, the Disney bot scans the videos on YouTube searching for content and bam, it hits two of my videos and flagged them. Why only two? I don't know. After all, I use clips in all of my videos, but I guess that the Matrix or Skynet or whatever is not perfect. 
yet. The unfortunate side effect of this botting practice was, of course, loss of time, effort, and revenue for me. And, of course, a guilty conscience for the executives at Disney that... <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, no. Disney loses nothing because they're Disney. That being said, Disney, unlike other large media companies that I shall not mention, <coughs> CBS. <coughs> Please note that Michael J. Crawford, a.k.a. the Anti-Trekker, had a real cough. Any similarities between the sound of his cough and any corporate names is purely coincidental. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, so Disney may be a large evil empire, but for the most part, they're an honest one. So props to Disney for restoring the copyright to my video that is part six in this series that, you know, you are now watching part nine of. Dang it. So, long story short, Disney filed a false DMCA, but they realized it was a false DMCA, so they retracted their DMCA. I, um, guess I could have just said that and saved a whole bunch of time, effort, and work there, but the force? I, I, I need to address this one last time. Why? Well, frankly, it's because I love you guys, and even though some of you, in my opinion, are just wrong, I get it. You want the film to make more sense. So first of all, just say it with me. The Last Jedi sucks because... Now toss in all sorts of reasons. Plot, characters... There's no gravity or air in space. Whatever. But do not use... The Leia should have died in her spaceflight thing. Please, just stop with it. Let it go. It's really not worth having the debate. I'm going to show one more physical example, and then I will be done. So, here's a rough approximation of the Rattus. Leo is ejected forward and up in relative position to the cruiser. We know that thanks to basic physics and the concept of speed, that if the Rattus was at a constant speed, Leia would simply at a constant speed, move away from the Rattus forever and ever. But those diehard fight to the end people like Captain Auritz, Ar Auritz, Captain Auritz, argue that my example does not account for the Rattus having engines. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think what you meant is to say that my example does not account for the fact that the Rattus was accelerating away from the First Order. But whatever, point taken. And you're right, I was trying to keep the example simple. Look, I have to admit, I'm used to this guy to physics arguing from Star Trek fans, but not so much from Star Wars. Let's be real. The universe's Star Wars is more about magic and spirit than about physics and science. But hey, let's go there. We do not know the exact speed or acceleration of the Rattus. In fact, we do not have any kind of even rough estimate based on on-screen evidence. So all we can do is toss out numbers. Now, logically, the Rattus is a huge ship, and as such, it is unlikely that it is accelerating at a particularly fast rate. So we'll just say that the Rattus is accelerating at one space unit per second per second. So that way, one space unit can mean whatever the heck you want, I don't care. So every second that the Rattus is burning fuel, it is going one space unit faster. So a space unit could be a foot, an inch, a meter, a mile, doesn't matter. It just gives us a number to work with. So in our example, we're going to start off with a speed of 1,000 space units per second. That's how fast the Rattus is going. So after the 1 minute and 51 seconds that Leo was in space, assuming that the engines were indeed engaged the entire time, means that the Rattus would at that point be moving about 1,111 space units per second when... Leia was recovered. So then how fast was Leia moving? Again, we don't know. But for the simplicity of this example, I'm going to say that she was ejected from the Rattus at a relative speed of 55 space units per second, and that she was ejected forward from the ship. Therefore, she was moving at a true speed of 1,055 space units per second, and the ship was moving at a true speed of 1,000 space units per second, and accelerating at a rate of one space unit per second per second. Now, I'm hoping at this point that the light bulb just popped on for some of you that have been arguing with me. 55 seconds later, Leia would still be moving at a constant speed of 1,055 space units per second, but the Rattus will have now accelerated to 1,055 space units per second, meaning that now they were traveling at the exact same speed, and it would appear, if you were watching it from a third-party position that was following the speed of the Rattus, it would appear that Leia had slowed down to a dead stop. The 
Radis then begins to overtake Leia as far as speed is concerned, and Leia is using the Force to guide herself back to the bridge of the ship. Really, she didn't fly back to the Radis as much as she just kind of steered herself. Her movement was not nearly as dramatic as the film made it appear. If you don't got, get that, well then, I got nothing. Frankly, for those of you that want to insist that we've never seen Force users use the Force to fly around or anything like that, Yeah, just suck on that for a while. Okay, I am really not going back there again. So, on the Radis, Finn and Rose are having a little moment. After Finn explained to Rose that uh, they can tr uh, track the ship in hyperspace, we get one of the dumbest technobabble moments in cinematic history. What did you shoot me with? Active tracking. What now? Hyperspace tracking is new tech, but the principle must be the same as any active tracker. So they're only, only tracking, tracking us, us from, from the lead ship. ship. We can't get to the tracker. It's an A-class process. They'll control it from the main bridge. Well, I mean, yes, but every A-class process has, has a dedicated, dedicated power breaker. breaker. But who knows where the breaker room is on a Star Destroyer. Well, the guy that used to mop it. If I can get us there, I can shut their tracker down. Let me get this straight. The ability to track through hyperspace is the same as any active tracking system. Therefore, they would have to track only from the lead ship. And since it's an A-class process, it would be controlled from the bridge. But like any A-class process, it would have a dedicated power breaker. But they need to know where the breaker room on a Star Destroyer is. But Ben knows that. So woohoo. Okay, look, I'm sure that some of you will disagree, but can't we just leave the techno babble to the experts? Now, uh, it's kind of nice to know, though, this is now official canon that really all you need to do in Star Wars to disable any capital ship is to get to the circuit breaker room. So, yeah. Uh, but seems that the whole massive ship or station or whatever built with a teeny tiny weakness that can easily take it out is not just a design problem that the Empire had back in the day. It is apparently just standard operating procedure in a galaxy far, far away. Also, apparently hyperspace is no longer hyperspace, I, I guess? Look, I know that the science behind hyperspace has always been a bit sketchy. However, the general idea is that hyperspace is another dimension that one can enter if you have a hyperdrive engine. And while you're in that other dimension, you can travel faster than light because force quantum, which I'm fine with. What I'm not fine with is saying things that contradict what I just said if you give it more than a moment's thought. <sighs> To suggest that tracking in hyperspace is like any other active tracker, well then, so much for hyperspace being in another dimension. The problem is that the conclusion doesn't even follow the facts. For example, if I were to say, and they were to write it this way, number one, hyperspace tracking would be a high priority system. Number two, all high, high priority systems have a dedicated circuit breaker. Therefore, the hyperspace tracker must have a dedicated circuit breaker. That would actually make perfect sense. But what they said was just stupid. To suggest that the hyperspace tracking system is just a regular tracking system with new tech would be like me saying that a submarine is just a car with new tech. No, they are completely different. One goes on land while the other goes in water. Whatever. Force quantum. And by the way, even if it is the same concept with just new tech, as they say, how stupid is it that they would only track them from one ship? Shouldn't all the ships be tracking them? You know in case there's a problem with the tracker on the lead ship, the force. So now I'm gonna talk about Mr. Impossible. They've tracked us through light speed. That's impossible. But now, after Finn acts like there's no way to track through hyperspace, just based on one assumption by Rose that's not even a logical assumption, he is now the official expert and knows exactly where it is because he used to mop the floors there. You know, where the impossible tech that could not have existed because, well, shouldn't he have seen it? <sighs> But even if you want to suggest, well, that's just because he didn't know what it was at the time. Okay, fine. But what was a stormtrooper doing mopping the circuit breaker room anyway? When have we ever seen a stormtrooper mopping anything? Anybody? Ever? 
Also, keep in mind that while the dialogue here doesn't explicitly say it, we're not talking about just any Star Destroyer, as we will see in a few minutes. We're talking specifically about Snoke's ship, the Supremacy. And it's not like the layout of a standard Star Destroyer and the Supremacy are going to be even remotely the same. So let me make sure that I get this right. The illustrious career of FN2187 was that he's a Stormtrooper hearse whose first battle was just a couple of days ago on Jakku. But... Before he'd ever seen a single day of action, he was stationed on Starkiller Base, the most advanced weapons platform ever constructed, where he worked as a sanitation stormtrooper. <sighs> and then, before he was stationed on Starkiller Base, apparently, he worked on the Supremacy mopping the Circuit Breaker Room, the most advanced starship ever constructed. In the next film, are we going to find out that Finn knows the super secret headquarters of the First Order because he used to mop there as well? <sighs> Subversion. Yay. Oh, yeah. And as stupid as it is that Finn knows where the circuit breaker room is for the tech that was impossible that Rose and Finn figured out was possible 10 seconds ago in 10 seconds. Well, guess what? Rose apparently also is an expert on how to shut it down. Yay. <sighs> Finn and Rose then explain to Poe how they figured it all out. So the First Order is only tracking us from one destroyer, the lead one. So we blow that one up. I like where your head's at, but no, they'd only start tracking us from another destroyer. But if we, but can if we sneak on board the lead destroyer and disable the tracker without them realizing... They won't we can... realize it's off for one system cycle. About six minutes. Sneak on board. Disable the tracker. Our fleet escapes before they realize. Hmm. <laughs> what? Wait, what? So they have a detailed map of the inside of Snoke's ship, which even includes the ability to highlight the impossible hyperspace tracker circuit breaker in red flashing lights, but they did not know that the tech existed and they didn't know where it was. The Resistance is beginning to look as stupid as the First Order. Rose gets the idea of stealing security codes to get in, but... How do we sneak the two of you onto Snoke's destroyer? We steal clearance codes. No, they're biohexacrypt and re-scrambled every hour. <laughs> huh? What? Is this seriously just a really badly written episode of Voyager? I mean, seriously, what's going on here? Just remember, we went from... That's impossible. ...to a map of the exact location of where the impossible tech is in a matter of a few minutes. Just how dumb does Ryan Johnson think we are? Oh, wait, never mind. So Poe decides to help them figure out a way to disable the tracker, but to not tell Haldo because she's a raving bitch. Well, can't argue with that one. Hit the like button, you will. Likes lead to comments. Comments lead to conversations. Conversations lead to understanding. Go to Patreon and support the anti-tracker you must, if supporting his videos you want. <laughs> yes, yes, support his videos. Then listen to this at the end of the videos. You will not.